I mean, uh, my name is Jennifer Wilcutt, and on behalf of the Logan County Board um, and Public Library, I'd like to welcome you. I'm a board member here along with several others that are here, and um, I'm also a librarian at Olmsted School, so I am a, um, a history buff and um, a lover of Logan County. So um, I would like to thank you again on behalf of the board and the library, and I'm going to introduce our gentleman up here. If you probably already know them since you're here, obviously. But, um, and tonight, as it is the 50th anniversary of the kidnapping of Miss Ella Gibbons and Mr. Um, Harper. So I'm going to let each of these men talk about their involvement in the case, and then Mr. Futro is going to do a reading from his um, newest book. And um, we're going to start with Mr. Roger, and then we'll go on to Jess Riley, and then Judge Fuqua will finish us before the reading. So thank you. Okay, <clears throat> let, let me know in the back if you can't hear me, okay. <clears throat> in, I think it was 2011, Ms. Wilcutt, as I call her, <laughs> conned me into coming down to Olmsted to do a presentation with these two gentlemen and uh, Detective McMillan, who was still living at the time, on the Harper case. And we met then and uh, rehashed the case with the students at the Olmsted School. And during the process, two or three people asked, have you ever considered updating the book? At which I had not at that time. And so that set the ball to rolling. And I have been working off and on, on trying to update the book. And every time I think I have it totally ready, then I find some new information or a new angle. And then I have to know that information by my attorney in Frankfurt. And so I'm still in the process, but I, I'm close to getting there. And I'd just like to tell you a couple of things about the, the uh, update. And one is I've done a new introduction to totally, you know, introduce the book from a new perspective 40 years later from the original. I've explained my sources. And, and let me clarify that. Judge Fuqua was so gracious when I first did this book in 1970, it came out in 1975, in allowing me access to the transcripts, allowing me access to the case file, which at that time at the Christian Circuit Courthouse in Hopkins. And a transcript of the testimony in that did not exist at the time because the verdict in Hopkins was not guilty, and as a result, as Judge Fuqua says, there was no appealable action. So Mrs. Mary Wilson Smith, who had transcribed the trial, did not type up an actual transcript. So what I did is took my notes and tapes that uh, had been made at the trial of the testimony and transcribed those and then ran by those by Mrs. Smith, who was still Judge Fuqua's stenographer, and she went over them and, and made corrections and changes and that type of thing. So I've explained all of that. Then I've done a postscript, which is roughly about 36 pages of events about the case since 1975. <coughs> and that includes, uh, for instance, I interviewed recently Mr. Dur w. Curry Milliken over at Bowling Green, who represented one of the defendants in the case. And Mr. Milliken uh, gave me you know, information and his opinion of the case and his view of the case. So that's included. Then I've done what I call an epilogue, which is 11 pages, which, yes ma'am, no, oh okay, <laughs> an epilogue, which is really a necrology or simply put those people who have died, and virtually 95% of the people involved in this case are deceased. Uh, as Mr. Ryan and I were talking a while ago, uh, there was a Thank jury. God, I'm in the minority. <laughs> <laughs> there was a jury panel of 14 that tried the case, and then two were dismissed at the end uh, to, to deliberate. And of those 14 people, only two are still living. Uh, so the majority of people are dead. And, but I didn't just put their name and their dead. I tried to update them what they did after the trial, if they were a juror or if they were an attorney, what they've done, their accomplishments, that type of thing and follow them until they did pass away. And then Mr. Riley was very gracious and loaned me his collections of photographs of the case. And so we're going to be able to use photographs that are appropriate. Uh, and what I mean by that, there were some autopsy photographs and stuff like that would, that would not be used. But appropriate photographs, and those would include photographs of Mr. Harper, of Mrs. Gibbons, their immediate families, the attorneys in the case, Judge Fuqua, uh, some of the jurors, that type of thing. 
So that's that's what the uh, update would include. And then this evening, if you all want me to and want to bear with me, I was going to just read some excerpts from my update, not straight through, but just passages here and there uh, from the update and give you an a sample of what I've done. Okay? There. Mr. Ron? Want, want me to? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at, uh, uh, at when the Harper, uh, Mr. Harper and Mrs. Gibbons were, were kidnapped and murdered, uh, I was a practicing attorney and later on I became county attorney. So uh, when this thing really broke open uh, uh, by the uh, statements from uh, Alfred Harvey down in, uh, in the penitentiary and so forth and, and Carolyn uh, Hampton Brown, uh, then I was the comp uh, county attorney and I, I participated uh, along with Jim Ryan, the, uh, the Commonwealth attorney, in the, in the trial of this. And also, I guess, it goes back to, uh, I went on a good bit of the investigation, in fact, uh, Detective Leroy Poo, who was one of the uh, uh, leading uh, uh, Texas State Police, and I went to Manhattan, Kansas to interview some of them. We went different places. But, uh, you know, I, I have not thought about this much until uh, Pathfinders, uh, back several months ago, asked me to put on the, a presentation of the entire case, which I did uh, for them. And, uh, but, uh, but uh, I, it, was, it was an interesting case, uh, a horrible case. Uh, I did have something that you all might be interested in. There's a picture of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Harper. And also the lady on the, on the, uh, on the side there is Carolyn uh, Hampton, Brown Hampton, a Hampton Brown, who was, uh, at the time this thing happened, a 15-year-old girl that... Uh, uh, was with uh, uh, with the people that went down there to uh, when the murder and uh, Mr. And Mrs. Uh, Mr. Harper and Miss Gibbons took place, and uh, of course she had she died a tragic death several years ago, and then the uh, people in, involved in it, uh, uh, like I say, there was only one <coughs> trial in this case, and that was of, uh, of James Taylor Loving and uh, the jury. Uh, uh, did not convict him. And uh, of course, in a criminal case, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And uh, in this case, uh, although Carolyn uh, Hampton Brown uh, did, in fact, uh, there's no question about what she was there. She told everything that uh, that happened. Uh, she and, and everything what she said was verified by other people during the trial. But uh, the jury felt it wasn't uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. And then. Uh, Alfred Harvey, who had uh, given the information, he fled and, and took a 15-year sentence uh, uh, and uh, served that out down at Eddieville. As far as uh, 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 Mr. Almond, uh, that never was brought to trial, and the cases were dismissed later on uh, 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 without prejudice, so they could be brought back. But see, this thing, this the breaks in this case didn't happen immediately. It happened about almost five years. Four years after the uh, after the uh, murder of uh, Mr. Harper and Mrs. Gibbons, so uh, there was uh, the evidence was not uh, real fresh, and it took a humongous amount of work. Uh, every uh, a lot of people did. Uh, state police worked on it, FBI worked on it, sheriff's office worked on it, and uh, G.C. McMillan, who is no longer with us, uh, was one of the lead detectives. Of, uh, Paul Hankins is uh, back here in the city where he was. Uh, he worked on it as a state police. It was state police. Uh, uh, it was a it was a team effort, and, uh, and it, if they had gotten to it uh, earlier, it may have turned out differently. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, sometime we if we'll have it, time to go through it in its entirety and uh, uh, talk about the witnesses and testimony and so forth and all of that. But that was my interest in it and uh, uh, like I say, I feel privileged to have been able to work on it and to, uh, to uh, try to try to bring justice to the uh, Harper and, uh, and Gibbons family. 
Okay, well, I, we, could, we could talk about this case for quite a while, I'm, and I'm sure all of you have but interests maybe that are a little different from the others, and I can talk, and uh, I'm not sure I'd uh, cover the point. So we, I think we'll probably end up with a question and answer period airport. Is that right, yes, sir. Uh, So it uh, won't take long with it. I, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of tell you a couple of things that, that I uh, that I remember about the case as much as anything that uh, stuck in my mind. But uh, first of all, the uh, the little gal that uh, was the star witness in the case was, uh, if you think they're having a struggle over there in the Mediterranean trying to get across the sea to establish a new home, those people are living in luxury compared to her. She was one miserable human being. Uh, she her, her lifestyle before, and she was young, and uh, she was absolutely... Uh, she just uh, was on the on the witness stand. It was uh, incredibly terrible for the prosecution. Uh, she broke down and, and so forth and, uh, on the on the stand, and uh, it was really unfortunate. Another interesting thing about this case to me, when I look back on it, is how the judicial system has changed today. Uh, at that time, we were really going through a uh, metamorphosis in the. Uh, in the criminal justice system in Kentucky. In 1952, we had uh, adopted what we called the new rules of civil procedure, which had, which had to do with the how cases were tried where people sue each other. But the criminal uh, uh, code still, was basically still the uh, old criminal code uh, where the prosecutors and our whole court system was, uh, criminal court system was on that. And uh, the significance of that is, is that Earl Warren was the beginning of a change of the, uh, of the uh, flavor of judicial or of trials throughout the United States. Uh, if you, if those of you who are old enough, uh, maybe would, uh, would recall reading in the papers that uh, when the Warren Court in the 60s had uh, had said you uh, had to uh, advise attorneys of their, I mean, uh, defendants or, or uh, suspects of their rights to have an attorney, and uh, there were just uh, the way of discovery and what the prosecution, the evidence they had to give to the defense. It was it was almost a, a new set of rules that was taking place slowly, and then the state of Kentucky uh, uh, and Judge Palmore uh, was one of the. Uh, Authors of the, he was had been the chief justice of the uh, of our court system, but he had changed the hadn't changed. He had written uh, a, a set of uh, rules, new rules, or of the or he had codified. He and another, and I can't remember who the other author of that was. I just remember that Judge Palmore said once it was very frustrating to try to uh, to. Uh, uh, lay out uh, new rules of evidence and how trials were conducted. So uh, that was another thing that affected this trial dramatically because of the way that uh, you had to uh, advise people of their rights as a result. That was all new in the past. The prosecution uh, didn't have the uh, restraints on them that they had after, uh, after the information of the rules. And no, I don't think people had talked about that very much because the average person wouldn't realize that was going on unless he was either a prosecutor or, or a defense attorney or a judge. So, uh, and then the most significant thing I remember and, and, uh, about the whole trial was uh, the day after, uh, after they, the, uh, the young lady that Jess uh, mentioned you say her name's Carolyn Hampton Brown. No kin to our present lieutenant governor. We didn't even know her middle name's Hampton. <laughs> so anyway, uh, she, uh, uh, well, let's see, I uh, lost my train of thought there. Oh, the, the day it broke, it was in Madisonville. And she decided, uh, I, I guess she, my recollection is she had gotten mad at her boyfriend. And uh, 
she wanted to give a statement. Well, I knew nothing about that, being, being a judge. I, I hadn't been interested in the prosecution or anything other than uh, if the case were brought. And I remember Ms. Peeler, who had been Mrs. Oscar Smith, who was my court reporter, came in the morning after she had been to Madisonville uh, at the request of Mr. McMillan, and I believe probably Mr. Riley was there. I, I, I can't remember whether it was him, whether he was there or not, but when she came in the next morning, she said she was sleepy, and I said, well, you know, what's the matter? And she said, I spent the night in Madisonville. And I said, what are you, what were you doing in Madisonville? And she said, they called and wanted somebody to take a statement uh, from uh, the little girl who, uh, or from this uh, young lady who claims that she was at the uh, uh, scene of the crime, that she was one of the participants in the crime. And she said they didn't have anybody else, so uh, they took me. And uh, I went over there and we, uh, they interviewed her and she gave her statement and I took it down. And, I said, well, that's, that's interesting. I said, what did you think about it? And she said, well, said, all I can tell you is that she knew things that I've never seen in the newspaper about what happened that night. And uh, that was the way it came out at the trial, too. And that was a lot of what the trial was about, that and her breaking down. But those, those are just uh, three of the things that I thought I'd mention uh, as a preliminary to questions of points of interest that people have. So I'll, I'll be quiet at this point and uh, let you do your reading or whatever it is. Well, one thing I'd like to back up what Judge Fuqua just said is I covered the trial in the high principle and every time Mr. Riley would bring up a point, invariably the defense would object and they would go back to chambers and Judge Fuqua spent a big part of the trial in chambers having to deal with what he just talked about changes in procedure and this type of thing, and he had to make some really hard choices. But that was you know, that was his role. He was a young judge. I think that was your first year on the bench, wasn't it? Uh, it was pretty close. Right. Very, very early on. Within the first two or three years. So what I would like to do now is just read as they, some, some sections from this, and then if, when we get through, if anybody has any questions of any of us, I think we're all agreeable we'll to try to answer uh, you know, any questions? And can everyone hear me okay? <clears throat> I can't see, so I'll have to. <laughs> Bear with me here. Lewisburg Bank President Edgar C. Harper and his daughter Ella Harper Gibbons were killed 50 years ago tonight at approximately 7 p.m. Only a handful of people touched by their case are still alive. Most of the Harper Gibbons family, law enforcement officers,